Everyone's here. Good morning. My name is Heather Lee, and I'm with Open Knowledge with the School of Data, and I'm here today with the Open Knowledge um, with the School of Data fellows, and we have a special guest, Hannah Williams, and Hannah is a designer, and she's going to teach us how to be a better designer in in 40 minutes. Everything we need to know about design. No, I'm just kidding. She's going to help us guide us through some of the design process and how better design thinking might help your data viz when you're working on data data driven projects. So Hannah, over to you. Tell us what what kind of things um, tell us um, you just ran a workshop this week. You just ran a workshop this week, Hannah? Uh yeah, we can do a couple of workshops in South Africa. Uh, one in Johannesburg with media organization and another one in Town which is working more with NGOs. Um, so with, with them, um, we've been developing some tools projects and hopefully they'll produce improved visualizations and sort of um, really effective projects that will actually contribute to some sort of social um, improvement sort of locally. Yeah. So it was a really cool experience and really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Yeah. So today you're going to share a little bit about that experience but also some more kind of guiding principles. I would say about design and data viz, so maybe I'll hand it over to you and let you get started. Cool. So, um, hey everybody, thanks for, thanks for coming and hanging out. Um, what I'm going to run through today is it's sort of about data visualization, but from a broader perspective, I'd like to look at design because I think all of you can probably make a basic visualization, um, but I think a lot of the design thinking, thinking around it and um, needs to be looked at in a bit more detail. And so the goal is to really make something that's um, actually effective, that achieves a goal. It's, it's not just a visualization for visualization's sake. Um, so just starting off, um, I've got a small presentation here, which I'll share with you. Yeah. Um, so you can see, yeah, you guys can see it. All right. Um, so this is the short intro. Um, my contact details, etc. If anyone doesn't have them, are at the bottom. Um, so this is a bit of a welcome. So firstly, I think the question we need to ask is, what is design? And um, I like the sort of very broad definition of saying that design is an interface we've created for the world that we live in. So from everything, from the first time that a caveman got a log and decided to use it as a chair and sit on it, it's changed the way we interacted with the world. So Every aspect of design is somehow changing up interactions with them. So the way you design your data visualization changes the way that people interact with the information. And once again, on a bigger level, the actual design of the web page that that data visualization sits on changes the way that people take in and interact with that information. Um, so design is very functional, is the primary sort of point. Um, so the most important question is what are you trying to achieve? Are you just making a visualization? Or are you try, like, what are you trying to do by making this? And often this is to sort of um, educate people, prove a point, um, start some advocacy perhaps, um, get people to take an action, maybe be, um, participate more in sort of governance, um, and so forth. So that's the first really important question for design. What are you actually trying to do? Um, <clears throat> like I was saying, a visualization just in isolation by itself is meaningless. It needs context. Um, so the, another way to look at it is to say, look, this person X looks at my visualization, and then what? What do you want them to do? Do you want them to contact their local government representative? Would you like them to join a cause? Would you like them to change the way they interact with other people based on the information they've learned, and so forth? Um, just some some basic <laughs> um, tips: keep things as simple and focused as possible. Um, Decide like who you're trying to reach, what you're trying to do, and then a really important thing, and this is where design comes in, is how can I make it as easy as possible for them to do this? So um, let's take a really simple example. Let's say uh, I've created a data visualization about um, how healthy fruits and vegetables are compared to junk food, and the goal of this is I would like um, school children in my area to eat more fruit and veg instead of junk food. Um, so how can we make it easy for them to do this? Um, um, in this kind of example, there will be several people involved in it. There may be headmasters at schools, um, the school kids themselves, um, the parents, and so forth. And each of those people needs to take an action to make your goal um, 
to the reality. And you need to try and basically develop a path of least resistance. Because people are innately lazy. Um, and <laughs> particularly if we're dealing with people in local government, people working with desk jobs, they've got a lot of other things to do. And if you're trying to get um, sort of a change in sort of city policy, for example, you really need to try and make this very easy for them. Um, so, for example, looking at fruit and veg, um, you might have person X um, on the left over there. Um, you see some visualization, uh, or he or she. Um, they're convinced that fruit and vegetable, using more fruit and veg is a great idea. And now, what do they need to do to actually implement that as policy? So, they need to take action, and there's various steps that need to happen. And in this example, to make things easier, you might have to give these people a presentation so they can convince their boss or the city council, or so the headmaster can convince the school board to um, invest resources and time in doing this. So it's not just a visualization. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be designed and thought about, because otherwise it's not design. It's just an image. And um, I think design needs to be far more than that to actually have an impact. Um, so just seeing this, let's say you have this person, and whatever you're visualizing, you've made some sort of visualization. And if you give it to them by itself, they have no idea what to do. They look at it, maybe it's pretty, they think, oh, that's very interesting. But what do they do? So it's important to build up all the context that is around your visualization. So you might start off, you might pose a question, for example, if this were on a web page. Um, and the visualization can help answer it. Um, you need to give it context. What does the information actually mean to people? And you have to have some kind of mechanism for people to do something or take an action. And how can you make it easy for them? Give them resources, uh, tips, contact information, um, logistical resources, um, whatever you can do to make it as easy as possible. Um, I also want you to look through the actual visual design process. Because now you know what you're trying to achieve, you can actually start trying to um, develop visuals, etc., to support what you're doing. Um, and something uh, I think is that design is 99% observation and 1% inspiration. Um, if you want to go and like, you know, release your inner angst and make fine arts and a beautiful image, um, you're sort of far better off um, going into fine arts or um, <laughs> you know, uh, maintain, making paintings or doing that sort of thing. If, if, if you're trying to create a functional design, um, it's really not about that. It's about having a function. And because we live in such a visual world with design around us all the time, we've got a lot of sort of automatic connections we make um, with the way things look and what we assume they do. Um, so design is not about you or your personal aesthetic or whether you like puppies and kittens and butterflies or whether you don't. Um, it's really about your target audience. And again, it goes back to what you're trying to achieve. Um, so the aesthetic is not just bells and whistles. Um, it's also a very, very functional aspect of displaying information to people and creating visualizations. Um, so one of the first steps in the design process that I follow, and this is just kind of our personal process. It's not necessarily um, what everybody might do, but I hope it will be useful for you. Um, so the first step would be to collect reference, for example. Um, Everything around you in the entire world is an idea and it is a design. Um, sort of the world is a design museum. So have a look around you. So for example, if I were trying to make something for the pharmaceutical industry, I'd go have a look at pharmaceutical packaging, um, things that, that, that function in that realm, for example, what the pills and medicine look like, um, what, you know, all of the, the visual aspects I can find. And start having a look at common um, elements and, and things that are very recognizable that communicate visually that this is about pharmaceuticals. Um, then the next step is to actually take these references oops, um, and analyze what makes them visually distinct. So I think this is a really simple example. So it's just kind of a tablet. And have a look like visually, what is it? Um, and this isn't some amazing, mysterious, creative process. It's really rational and logical. So have a look. For example, pills have these rounded corners. Um, it has areas of solid color. It's got some gradients and shadows. It has a shadow on there that gives it some three-dimensional depth that looks like a real object. And I can take these things and then go and develop a set of design rules. Um, let's go back here. And once you develop the set of design rules for whatever you're trying to achieve, just stick to them and keep them really simple. Don't, don't overcomplicate this. It's not like some amazing artwork you have to produce. It's a very functional thing. 
So, for example, and I mean, this isn't a, it's a really, really simple example, but um, taking a look at this code, you wanted to translate it into the design. I'm just taking those like three very simple aspects, and I, I can apply it to typography, I can apply it to bars and charts, um, I can apply it to the way the images are treated and, and other text. And it starts getting very consistent and just starts looking neat and professional um, and not too crazy. Um, so just as an example, perhaps I personally might like butterflies and flowers. I can make a design that I think is personally great, but it's not necessarily talking to my target audience or communicating very well that this is related to pharmaceuticals. Um, so yeah, that's just an example. Um, then just some interesting like like tips. So once you've sort of developed a sort of set of design rules, um, you need to have a look at making layouts. And um, there's quite an art to, to laying out information. Um, and the first step to doing this is create an information hierarchy. And this is essentially, it's not complicated. You just need to look at what order do I want people to read things in. So what's the most important thing? What's the secondary thing? Um, what information is essential? And what information is kind of interesting to read more um, if they can, can continue with? Um, so <clears throat> looking at it, um, if you can say things in less words, do it. Um, try and keep your copy as short as possible. Um, it's very tempting, especially if you're very um, familiar with the topic, um, you, you tend to want to over-explain it to people. Um, and this isn't necessary. You can do that in, in another page of text if you can read more. But to communicate quickly, if people can only take in two or three main points, what are those points going to be? And test this on yourself. Um, start putting things in the layout or put things on a page. And notice what order that you read those things in. And if you're not reading it in the right order, change it. Um, there's just a really simple example here um, that has sort of a main point, essential important info. And um, I hope it works for you, but the way I read this, um, it sort of reads in that kind of order. Um, so it's not sort of an amazing science, it's just a very simple, straightforward way of looking at things. Um, a few other things about layout. Don't be afraid of white space. Um, Give things breathing room. If you try and cram everything together, it becomes extremely overwhelming. People won't take it in. They'll leave away. They'll, they'll leave your page. Um, the same thing goes for visualizations. Don't try and put everything in one massive interactive visualization. Um, it's far more effective to present the information that is important to those people, and rather break it up so that people can click through to a bunch of separate, uh, simpler, <laughs> a bunch of separate simpler visualizations than. Um, having one massive one with too much information. Um, again, if you're presenting your information and it's not in the online format, um, use lots of slides. Um, it doesn't matter how, you know, it's not going to influence how long you're speaking for because you're going to be saying the same things. But in order to illustrate your points very clearly and keep things um, quite simple, um, break it up. Don't put like piles of text and images on a single page. Um, OK. so. Typography is a big thing, and it's a big word, and it sounds very designy. Um, there's a whole art of typography, um, but in order to create effective designs, you don't need to be a typographer or, or know everything about it. Um, I'm going to tell you to simply copy typography and design examples from other things that work well. Somebody else has already done this and worked it out, um, and there's a lot you can learn from it. And a nice way to do this, or a very simple way to do it, um, if you're looking at things on the web, is take a website. If you like click on it, um, there's usually something that says inspect elements. And you'll be able to have a look um, uh, at, at the um, uh, style inspector. And you'll be able to see what fonts they use. And it's not just about the fonts. It's about the letter spacing, um, the line height, uh, the styling they've added to the text. Um, so take note of that. And it's totally fine to have a look at those things, use it, um, and borrow from it as much as possible. Um, because it's already been worked out. Rather than start starting from scratch and struggling for hours, going through every single font on Google Fonts and trying to work out what works and what doesn't. Um, there's also really nice online resources. Um, I'm not going to list them all, but pretty much if you just Google Google font combinations, um, you'll find a whole bunch of them. And it's nice to try and um, search by dates as well um, in your search results for online reference, um, just because you get the most recent um, sort of design advice. And um, a nice, nice thing to look for is Google font combinations. And so, for example, like this is just one example from one website. It's saying Oswald and Lasso. They work quite nicely together. You can see how they sort of 
um, look quite nice and tidy and have a bit of a difference. Um, so that's just a quick, easy way of finding fonts. Um, again, typography. <laughs> Try and stick to brand style guidelines and colors. Um, if you're working with something, for example, with the School of Data, or if you're working for another organization, have a look at how, what their things look like. Look at their logo. Try and keep things as uniform as possible. I know it sounds very boring, um, but the reason for this is this falls in line with people's expectations of a level of professionalism. If you go and look at any brands, and whether it be a Nike, or if you're going to go look at a corporate brand like IBM or banking, whatever, you will notice that all this stuff is extremely consistent. They keep it the same. They don't change one thing to butterflies and flowers, and the other thing is a very serious um, black and white. Um, and even though it might seem boring, it keeps consistency, and it's easier for people to understand and immediately know that whatever you're creating is part of the campaign. Um, and so if you've got a whole range of visualizations you're producing, try and come up with a style that you can apply to sort of all of them so they look like they fit together and it's all, all related. Um, it just makes people, it's psychologically more comfortable for people to deal with that. And um, it just keeps things looking neat and tidy. Um, images. Basically, it's better to use no images than bad images. Um, you can make a beautiful design and have poor quality images and it immediately just brings the entire um, level of, of the whole thing down. Um, and once again, I know we're all into open source and, and all that kind of stuff, but sometimes it's really worth investing in quality stock images. Um, they're really not that expensive, and at the end of the day, some photographers work hard to bring you those photos um, and really just use them because it can make all the difference. Um, when you're choosing images, and particularly if you're trying to um, uh, work for a cause or, or, or a larger goal. Um, so, for example, you're working with an advocacy group and you produce some visualizations and you need to place them on a page. Um, try and get the sort of um, images that um, are related to what they're doing. And um, using people, um, it, it's a weird trick and it's using advertising and it sounds like a horrible thing, but essentially, as human beings, we're natural imitators. So, you'll definitely um, find that. that if you try and use imagery with people doing what you want them to do, it will be more successful as a kind of pay. And the other thing is try and keep it aspirational, as in um, make it what people wish or, or what, what they're trying to achieve or would like to do later. So, for example, let's say I was trying to uh, work on a campaign that would help um, overweight people exercise more and uh, eat, eat more healthy. I'm not going to show images of unhealthy, overweight people because that's where this, this target audience is. I'm going to show images of healthy people having a good time exercising because that's their aspiration where they want to be. Um, and then just another small tip, save uh, images for the web if you're going to use them at the size that they will be used. Um, it's a problem with a lot of websites. You find some image on the, on the Creative Commons website and you dump it in there and it's either massive or way too small. Um, at the end of this presentation uh, is, is a tool for just making your images the correct size um, uh, that you can use, and I'll share that with you. Has anybody used an image that um, that that gave you a mixed message or didn't didn't work in a presentation? Um, I have an example where, like when I first did the Haiti response, I used an example of an apple pie as to how simple it would be. Um, to to get involved, and someone said that's too American. Don't do that again. And I was like, what? It's just a pie. And they're like, it's a symbol. And so so thinking about and so what I learned from that was that even if it's just an image, you have to think about the symbols around it and and think about um, the framing of it, and not just what the image says, but what it doesn't say or what people may construe it as. And that that blew my mind in terms of I thought, well, it's just it's just pie. And they're like, no, it's not, Heather. And so that was a good lesson learning for what not to do with images. Does anybody else have examples of images that have just been the wrong message? No, I thought I'd embarrass myself. Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay. Um, a quick thing about image formats. Um, I, I know you're probably familiar that JPEGs and GIFs um, and so forth all exist. Um, I just wanted to quickly explain, because sometimes there seems to be some confusion around it, when is a good time to use um, these sorts of 
uh, different file types. Um, broadly, there are two types of images, um, what are called raster images and vector images. Um, raster images are simply used as grid colors um, to define an image. And you'll notice, you can tell these, so if you find a data and you zoom into it, um, you'll start seeing um, a whole bunch of pixels. And this is because, I have to show you an example here. Um, there's a picture of a kitten that should be happening here. Yeah. All right. So this, for example, is a, is a picture of a kitten. Um, and this is a, a rusty image. If I zoom all the way in here, I can start actually seeing the pixels. And if I go all the way in, it's probably the glory for you guys. But you can see that all the information that um, defines this image is, is sort of on a grid of different colors. Um, Vector images, like this block, for example, um, they're created by using a mathematical calculation between points. So it doesn't matter how much you zoom into it or how large you make it, the edges will always remain very crisp and clear. Um, so you can see that compared to. Um, so there are a variety of different sort of raster image formats that you use grid in. Um, you're probably familiar with JPEGs. Um, the way JPEGs work is that um, they're a compressed format, so they say file size, um, and they do this by using uh, some rather complicated algorithms. But to simplify it, they essentially kind of blur information um, to save um, image quality. And you can contrast this with things like um, GIFs and PNGs. Um, what they do is they use a specific uh, limited color set. So I don't know if you've ever tried to save an image or seen images that um, have been saved as a GIF or a PNG, and notice they look really weird. Um, I can show you an example again. Um, this one. Um, so if I save this image, uh, I'm, I'm just using Photoshop here because it's a nice, it's an easy way to show this. Uh, So I'm just trying to get the speed share button. Um, okay, it's not working. Well, anyway, um, yeah. So um, JPEGs and 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 GIFs. The the time to use JPEGs is when you have photographs or gradients um, in your images, and the best time to use sort of GIFs and PNGs is when you have flat colors, so for example, with logos or um, typography often, um, if there's a lot of typography, or simple things like maps. Um, so usually for, for data visualizations, if you're saving it out, um, you can get a much smaller file size by saving it as a PNG or a GIF rather than a JPEG. Um, JPEG is cool for photos. Um, so yeah, photos, gradient, JPEG, GIFs, the flat colors, and um, so things like logos. So, um, I don't know if anyone has questions about the image formats. Does that make sense? I you all know this already. Not for these. Um, let's just go back to you. Okay. Oh. So my screen share button stopped working for some reason, um, but I'll just carry on talking to you. You can have a very presentation. Hey, hey, Hannah, your sound is a little bit muffled. Um, maybe wear oh. both headsets. Maybe that might help. Okay. Well, the, the the microphone's on my laptop, so. I know. Maybe it's because you're moving back and forth. I'm not sure, but somebody just said it's a little. <laughs> Sorry, I also is, is sway that, uh, and move when I'm talking. I, I, I get that. So maybe <laughs> I just had a request. But you, you cool. had a question about, does anybody else have questions about how to size? Is that, is that what your question was? Uh, yeah, and, and, uh, with regards to image formats. Um, you said that you have some tools to share with us, though, right, on best practices? I'm always looking for the quick and dirty way to get the image in there so I can go do my other work. So I'm the, I'm your designer's yeah. worst nightmare. I'm like, I've got other things to do. Can I just like make it fit? <laughs> yeah, but that's exactly the approach. You don't want to end up wasting time on design if it's sort of not your, um, yeah, it, it, it can just be a massive um, time suck out of what you're trying to do. Um, 
so taking a look, um, I've, I've put this in, in the in the presentation, but my screen share is not working for some reason. It's just decided to give up on me. Um, but yeah, so just some interesting things, um, some useful resources. I find um, there's a website called um, imageoptimizer.net, and it's just a very simple free online tool to resize and optimize your images. Um, if you're working to place things in a blog or on a website, um, the cool way to just see how large your images need to be is again use the um, right click and um, inspect elements. And if you mouse over the various elements, you should be able to see the size of the area that your image needs to, to fit into. And so it will usually be something like um, 720 pixels by whatever the height is. Um, so what you can do is take your image um, into Image Optimizer, import it, and just make sure that it's the correct size. Um, when images are too small, they're going to be stretched larger, and they'll usually pixelate, and this looks terrible. Um, when images are too large, um, they just take up a lot of load time, and so it doesn't make sense. Um, and also, sometimes when images are scaled disproportionately, they can be really distorted, and this just doesn't look cool, and you can't see what's going on. Um, another tool that, that's kind of useful is, um, I don't know, I, I assume you guys are familiar with Google Fonts. Um, it's a really nice font resource. Um, ironically, the only browser that Google Fonts don't render very nicely on is Google Chrome. <laughs> um, they're working on this, but uh, uh, just be aware of that. They don't look the same. Um, they do look better on the other browsers. Um, and then just for um, color palettes, um, it's a bit of a long link, so I'll, I'll share it with you in, in, in the slides. But um, there's a lot of color palette tools for choosing colors, colors that work together. Um, and one of the tools I've, I've shared is a rather nice one where you can take an image or a logo and you can upload it and from that it will pull, pull out a color palette um, with all the hex values, etc. that you can use for in your design or in your data visualization. So if you are working for an organization that has a specific logo or set of colors, um, you can kind of easily match it up like this without having to go through a long process. It's just really quick and easy. Hey, Nisha has a question for you, Hannah. Nisha, are you able to state it, or would you like me to read it? Yeah, no, I got it. Um, I take a lot of screen grabs, um, usually because I'm either in a tool that I just need to grab a part of the screen, or it won't let me take the image. Um, is there a way to kind of get better quality screen grabs or uh, optimize them in a better way? Because they're really they are really tough to kind of. Uh, make bigger or to optimize in any kind of capacity, actually. Yeah, yeah. Screen grabs. I mean, I, I, I kind of because I have um, sort of a, a, a suite of design tool that I, I tend to use those. Um, but there's there's a whole bunch of free screen capture um, applications. Um, but once again, if you do have a screen grab, you can use something like the um, ImageOptimizer.net. Um, just drop it in there. It's fairly quick, and you can crop it. Um, yeah, like Kadrina's sharing one. Um, this is a cool one as well. Um, yeah, so, so so just to say, because what does happen, and um, for example, like I often work, I work with two screens. Um, so when I do do a screen grab, it tends to capture both the screens. So I always have to crop it before I send it to somebody. And it's always a good idea to optimize things, because when you are sending um, things via Skype or via chat or via email, it's just cool to try and like not waste um, too much bandwidth. Um, or time sometimes. Um, Berlin has also got quite a nice one as well. This is a cool one. Um, so, like, I think it really depends depends on your preferences. Um, I'm not going to make a very specific recommendation. Um, so, 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 sorry, Nisha. <laughs> Probably doesn't answer your question very well. But um, yeah, it, it is a good idea to just sort of crop them and optimize them if possible. So, uh, like, I'll add these. I'll add. I'll add both of these to the end of the presentation as well. So, we have them. perfect. So that's There's another helpful. question. Oh, go ahead, Misha. No, no. I was just saying thanks. It was helpful. <laughs> I had another question for you. Um, um, some of the staff are watching. Just so you know, they're watching on YouTube. So, no pressure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's Sam, I, and you met Sam at summer camp. So, he wanted to yeah. know if you could kind of like um, kind of give more details about Google Fonts. Now, you talk about it like it's your brother, and it's new to me. So, can you uh, can you unpack it for new folks? Okay. Um, so essentially, what what Google Google has done is they provided a library of uh, free fonts for use on the web. Um, 
You're also able to use them for print applications or, or other uses. Um, they all under an open license. And um, the collection over the last few years has really built up um, to like a nice variety. So I'll just um, share the link here because I can't share my screen. Um, so the link is basically google.com forward slash fonts. And you're able to search fonts or, or browse them um, via a bunch of criteria. Let's just place this in here. Um, and 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 looking uh, and and the, the the nice thing about it, particularly if you're working with web, um, they're very simple and easy to embed on your website. So you're not limited to just using the standard system fonts like um, Arial and Times New Roman and um, Vidano or Vidano, however you prefer to say it. Um, you can use a whole range of, of, of really nice looking fonts. Um, so if you do visit Google Fonts, you'll notice that um, you can filter them by category. Um, and there's serif um, and sans serif, which is basically fonts with the little pointy bits on the um, end of the letters. <laughs> I think that's the simplest way to explain it. Um, display fonts, uh, which are usually used for posters or, or, or larger applications. Um, they're usually um, quite decorative. Um, so they're quite, if you're looking for a fun font for a poster, um, or headlines, um, you'd look um, inside the display category. Um, and then there's also sort of handwriting fonts, which is self-explanatory, and monospace typefaces, um, which uh, it just means that the space in between the letters is very regular, um, and this is often used for um, applications, sort of sometimes like technical drawings, etc., where the, the, the type needs to be spaced very evenly um, and, and fit in with things um, very well. Um, it's, it's not a massive, massively important distinction probably for you guys. Um, yeah, and so the nice thing is once you've chosen a couple of fonts um, that you'd like to use, you can quite easily embed them into a website. Um, so there's, a bot uh, there's some tools at the bottom. I don't know if you guys are on Google Fonts, but there's a few tools at the bottom, and it takes you through a couple of steps. Um, you can choose a font, um, and once you've chosen it, you can choose to review it. Um, like your selection, and then you're able to use it. And if, if you sort of um, select some fonts and add them to your collection, there's usually a button next to each um, sort of font example that says add to collection. If you add it to collection um, and then go and view your collection, which is usually under the, 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 the user or review, um, you'll find that um, if you have a type, you'll, you'll have your typeface you chose. And um, there'll be all the varieties of fonts there. So, like, so it may be, um, for example, if I look at Open Sans, which is a very um, popular um, and nice and neat and tidy font, and there's sort of a light version, a normal version, a bold version, italic, bold italic, extra bold. Um, so when you are using it on a website, you want to just use the, um, just select the ones you're actually going to use. So if you're only going to use a normal one, an italic one, and a bold one, um, just select those. Um, so once you've chosen the fonts you want to use, um, you'll see there's a very, if you scroll down a little bit on, on the Google Fonts um, page, you can simply add um, a link, um, and this usually goes in the header of, of your website. There's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, there's the, the, the standard way is just simply linking to the, the Google Fonts font style sheet, um, and this needs to go in the header of your page where you would link to um, uh, sort of uh, nearby where the meta information, like your site description, would be in your HTML. Um, or you can use the at import command, and you can also do it via JavaScript. Um, I'm not incredibly, incredibly technical, so I'm not going to try and tell you why I think each method is better, because I'm possibly wrong. <laughs> um, but, what, but once you sort of link to the fonts, um, then you can simply use it in your style sheet, just like you would say font that Font family um, is Arial or, or whatever you'd like to use. Um, uh, you can just refer to whichever cool Google, Google font you've chosen. Um, and there's like a really nice, nice variety. So I have a question here from Cordina. Um, so if I don't sound like Cordina, I do apologize. Um, there are people typing in the side. She wanted to know if there's open source fonts or uh, available or images. Like we've talked about Creative Commons and images um, just in the chat previously, but um, are there open source fonts? Because Google may not be open source fonts. Uh, 
they, they are pretty much open source fonts. Uh, all the Google okay. fonts you can, yeah. Um, you can download them onto your computer and use them for prints or what, whatever you like. Um, it's a completely open source font library, which, which is what makes it really cool. Um, most fonts aren't. Um, you probably have a whole bunch of illegal fonts on your computer just because they tend to accumulate. Um, most of them do have licenses. Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know. Um, and the licenses can be very expensive for some of the professional fonts, um, but people tend to share them. I mean, I don't know anyone who's ever been sued for using fonts, but I mean, just to keep the best practices, um, I do try and use open source fonts or ones that I actually own a license to. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just checking out the chat. Um, so there's Google Fonts. Um, for images, um, I'm just trying to find. I'll just try and share the resource with you here. Um, there's there's quite a nice um, uh, site for searching through um, uh, Flickr images that just have um, Creative Commons licenses, and so you can search by license type. Um, it's tricky. Um, the disadvantages of trying to use free images is that you usually have to sort through um, a lot of pictures. Um, and so this takes time. So sometimes it can be quicker to simply purchase uh, some paid for stock images that you know um, will be good. Um, I'm trying to get you, um, for you. Hannah, as a designer, do you take photos? Do you, do you take a lot of photos and then use them as part of your content? Um, I don't. Um, I'm not photographer. Well, like I, I understand photography, but I don't. I don't consider myself a photographer, um, sort of on a professional level. I, I, I just it, it is it is kind of tricky to do it really well, um, particularly if you're doing very specific things. For example, um, shooting food is incredibly difficult, and it's a whole art art form <laughs> in itself. Um, shooting products really well um, is is actually quite difficult. And I know everyone can sort of take a photo and it looks okay. But um, if you are working on something, and I'm, I'm talking about now what I'm working like as a professional designer, if you're trying to um, market somebody's product and you're going to put it next to other very professional products, you don't want to have sort of average looking photos. They really have to be good. Um, and photo quality is really, really important. Um, so so I, I don't usually shoot my own photos, but I'm not much of a photographer. Um, if you have better photography skills and equipment than I do, um, you could probably do it. And things like event photos um, are probably easier to work with in very specific sort of product photography or food photography um, if you're making a menu for a restaurant or something. Yeah, I hear they shellac that food. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so it's good. Like, so <laughs> not tasty. Um, so uh, there was a question from Corina. Um, do you um, have a post or a design that you're proud and that you think represents that you might be able to share with us? And maybe a short explanation of the so, so you. Serve up, serve up some of your examples potentially with about fonts and images. And while you're hunting for that, I have a secondary question or just kind of a comment. Yeah. Last day I attended an event where there was a, a UX expert who worked in telecom in Canada, and she was talking about um, hosting a meeting with people who want to give input into your design and how to analyze a room uh, from a psychological point of view. <laughs> And she said, she said some really interesting things. No, she said, you know, and I know that sounds really kind of like shady, but I think she was actually quite brilliant. Well, um, so when you said that designers um, spend 99% of the time observing, what really struck me about her, um, my pleasure about being a voice, uh, what was really struck me about what she said was that um, she assesses the room and um, not just in terms of who, what the power dynamics are, but about what they think about design, what they know about design in order to be able to meet their needs. And so that was really fascinating to me to think about um, how she um, how she looks at a room and how, how it affects her design. And so when you say observing, I'm wondering if you have some examples for that as well. Um, yeah, like <laughs> working with people in design is, is, is really tricky. Um, uh, not to offend people and also because a lot of people, like people's uh, personal aesthetic really comes into play. Um, and I, I've had clients say things to me like, oh, like my wife really prefers this color, um, we should really use this. And it's even when, when whatever we're making is not for his wife, um, it's, it's for a completely different set of people. Um, and so w the, when you're getting design input, because uh, yeah, it's a really cool question actually. Um, when you're getting design input on, on something you've created, um, try and ignore what they're telling you to do, because people will often say, yeah, I think this thing should be bigger and more to the left and more purple, 
um, ask them why they think it. Um, and when they start explaining what their problem is, then you can come up with a solution for it. Because what they're doing is giving you solutions. And, and I find this, um, because sort of uh, design and aesthetics is something that everybody deals with in their everyday lives, um, and, 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 and not to say people aren't, but um, sort of everyone thinks they're an expert on it. Whereas if I show pe people a bunch of code or, 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 or sort of the back end of a system, um, people are less likely to say, oh, I think you should move that CSS and JavaScript over there and, um, you know, change, change your syntax because they, they don't feel like they understand it. Um, so just as if you were assessing an application that you created using, um, or developed using, you know, programming, you'd have a look at what people are, what people are trying to achieve and what they're trying to tell you, not what they tell you to do. Um, it's quite difficult to do tactfully, <laughs> um, to, to really, um, get people to, to, to sort of take your advice. But, but I think it's important to let people know that you're understanding what they're saying. You accept that they have a point. So maybe they're saying that your heading should be bigger and purple because it's not standing out enough. And there's other ways to stand it out that might work, like just be aesthetically better or a bit neater. Um, but yeah, it, it can be very tricky. I have to say, Hannah, you've just given me a new game, though. I'm going to, the next development project that I work on, please don't work with me for a while, guys. I am totally going to tell <laughs> a developer to move their code and watch what happens just for fun. I think, <laughs> no, no, I think, you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right that a designer, you know, how they look at things and the input they give as an expert, you know, I think that um, much like community, everyone has an input, right? So uh, it, it's interesting, very interesting how you frame it. Yeah, like a lot of the time I, I wish I was a plumber because nobody argues with a plumber when he says you need a new pipe here, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, you had an, oh yes, uh, examples of stuff. Um, examples of stuff. Any other questions from folks? Um, we've had some good discussion. Hannah, I have to say you've been inc incredibly thorough and very giving in terms of what the process looks like and explaining it and um, that's that's been pretty exciting. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, I, I hope it's been useful. I, I think I possibly maybe went over the, the first bits a bit quickly, um, but the most important bits are at the beginning of the presentation, if you look at it again. And um, like I really do feel that functionality defines design more than anything else. Um, and the aesthetic always comes from that. And um, it's kind of an extra layer on top of things um, more than anything else. Um, here's an example, and I'm going to use it. You, I don't know, you possibly have all seen this, um, but it's a quite a fun one to talk through because um, <laughs> it has data visualization, it has design, and a lot of these are actually very bad visualizations. Um, Anna, can you show it like on your design. screen at all? Can you show it on your screen at all? Just because. Yeah, let me, let me try on I'm just okay. the screen share. Mm -hmm. Second button down on the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's just uh, it's not doing anything when I click it. Close and stuff. Yeah, Google's been really. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, this is better. Let's do okay, this. perfect. So let me just. Th that way, it. anybody who's watching, they can have it later. Thanks. Cool. There we go. Um, so let me just move this. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to show you is essentially um, this. This was one of my first adventures into data visualization. Um, I had no idea what I was doing at all. Um, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it was very interesting, but kind of rather amb ambitiously um, just work with another designer and um, sort of try to get this stuff working. Oh, come on, brother. Sorry, bear with me. And, uh, let's just do this. Uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> Excuse hey, just walk us through it. Don't worry, don't worry. I'll put the link up. Just walk us through it, Hannah. We can open it up in another screen. Anyway, all right, cool. I'll, I'll see if I can get it with it. I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it in the meantime. Um, so essentially, this was a really interesting project. Um, it was different from our usual design project. It was, um, it's like a public art project. Um, and the idea was to create some things on some new bus stations they were, they were um, putting up around Cape Town. Um, and so we sent we sent a proposal um, that was uh, for using data visualization because we thought, well, you know, data visualization is very cool. How hard can this be? We can really do some cool stuff. <laughs> um, so and and they, they, everyone really liked this idea. Um, and so the idea was to try and use information that is related to the space. 
that is around the bus stations because um, sort of the when people use public transport and um, sort of you get on at a station, you get on this bus or train or something, and you carry on in there, and then you get off in a completely different place. So you're very like disconnected from the landscapes you're moving through um, because you don't actually get to interact with it very much. Um, not as if even if you're traveling, you know, driving yourself, you probably look out the window a bit more or um, have to find your way around. Um, so we were trying to make things that, that, that would allow people to just learn a little bit or feel a bit more engaged with the landscape. Um, and so some of these are quite interesting. I'm just seeing if the screen share might be working. Um, yeah, so like I, I kind of really like this project, even though um, it, it was uh, rather difficult um, in many places, primarily about dealing with data. Uh, things that I've learned since, for example, pivot tables <laughs> would have saved me days and days of work. Um, can you guys see that? Yeah. Cool. So there's a bunch of six visualizations here, um, and I'll just go through some of them. Some of them are quite fun. Um, I thought this was kind of an interesting one. Um, this this tracks the population. Um, so you can kind of see um, these these images or these artworks appear on the side of bus stations. They're on glass. They're about eight meters long, so they're they're very large. Um, and this sort of places the design in a different sort of context. Um, they're designed to be seen from a distance, so it was very important that from, from a distance, if you looked at it, that it was a really nice image, um, and up close that you could understand or learn something about um, what you were looking at. So this basically takes census data um, from 1865 up until just about the present. And um, the only thing that's been consistently tracked um, in, in South Africa is sort of the, the race of people. Um, but it's a very interesting thing because it, it shows how cultural, cu culturally um, this particular area has changed over time um, from when previously it was sort of local indigenous people like the Khoi and the San and how um, sort of uh, the Dutch sort of colonized it and um, how, how sort of things changed on um, the slave trade, how it influenced population. And today it's a really interesting area because it has such an eclectic mix of um, people and cultures. And just so we thought this was a really like sort of interesting thing um, to show people, and it's kind of fun. And through each point, um, we've tried to include some information and some historical facts about um, things that may have happened that influenced the population. Um, and like I've written about, there's a whole detailed thing you can go through further down here. Um, sort of um, things that have driven immigration into this area, um, and things like economic factors that have changed, uh, driven population change. Um, so yeah, I thought that was kind of cool because it's actually just a really nice visual um, at, at one level, but it also is a really fun thing to explore while you're waiting for the bus. So I kind of like these projects. Um, yeah, so we kind of did six of these, and some were more successful than others. So Hannah, um, you know, um, by, if I yeah. had a plane, t if I had plane ticket money, I'd have you come and design the ones in Toronto. They're glass. They're beautiful, and they're covered with ads. <laughs> <laughs> so can so use some art. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so so I, I really like this. Yeah, this is a project I really enjoyed um, working on. So. And I, well, I can sh show you more if you really want to, but I think it, time is kind of uh, running out. Yeah. Yeah, I have plans for you. We're gonna blog it. We'll give you. We'll give uh, people access. <laughs> If I could, after you get some rest, you've had such a busy week by running a workshop and then doing the Skillshare. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you so much for sharing and being so generous with some theory and some thoughts and really kind of thinking of how we can apply it to um, the work that we're doing at School of Data and also to anybody who's part of this wider community and how they can use it. So I just want to say thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, does anybody else have any last minute questions for, for Hannah or comments? Everyone's really quiet. We're all worried about our background noise. I think I was a little bit vigilant on that <laughs> one earlier. <laughs> okay. Great, 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 well, great. I, think I, was like, I, I hope that was useful. Um, I'm not sure if that was what everyone expected, but if you have any other questions or anything I can help you with design-wise, um, I'm more than happy to. So please give me a shout. Yeah. Thanks, thanks again, Hannah. That was fantastic. That was really great. Cool. And I did learn lots. And now I have all these <laughs> questions. And now I have no choice. I have to make sure my image is sized before, before someone comes and arrests me for those bad images. <laughs>